So let me begin with a few words about myself. Uh, I claim that we exist and are unique. Uh, that seems to be true. I think each of us has a unique story. Uh, you've heard some of what I had to say at the reading last night. I have a chapter in the testimonials book, so I'll try to make this brief. My father's family fled Cuba and moved to Miami in 1960. And so this is my father's family in the mid-1950s before they uh, moved to the US. You can draw your own conclusions as to why they moved in 1960. Now, somewhat unusual for this conference, my mother's Japanese, and she was born in Hiroshima in 1943, which history will tell you is not a good time to be born in Hiroshima. So she's actually an atomic bomb survivor and came to the US in 1969. And I know this is very predictable, but what would you expect from a Cuban and a Japanese person? Of course, they met in New Jersey. That's where I was born. And you can see me there rocking the 1970s styles there. Uh, this picture is from Miami in the 1970s. I hate to date myself, but well, what can I do? I grew up in San Jose, California, and this is like a scene from Stranger Things. It's literally me in the 1980s in an arcade playing video games with my friends. So what, what else could be more Stranger Things? I got my BA and PhD in mathematics at UC Berkeley. This is me graduating with my PhD. That's my advisor, Donald Saracen. And I'm now supposedly an award-winning mathematician. I put that in air quotes because I want the young people to realize that that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm great or smart or anything. I've met plenty of people smarter and more talented than I. Uh, probably few people who are harder working. I think hard work trumps talent. I hate to use that word, but hard, hard work beats talent uh, much of the time. And what it means is that you know, I've won awards. That means I sort of now have figured out after many years how the community works what the valuation system is and what I need to do to be able to get these sort of perks. And it's something that the young people here uh, can aspire to. It has nothing to do with talent or uh, anything of that nature. Now, my path was not without struggles. I don't want to burden you with tales of, you know, woe. I, I mean, I, I don't, I, I, I was pretty fortunate to have supportive parents who valued education. I was pushed and I was in the right environments. I found mentors at exactly the right time when I needed them. So there was a lot of luck in my journey. It wasn't something that was predestined or preordained. It was a combination of luck, good fortune, hard work. Uh, and you can read more details in the testimonials chapter. So I don't want to burden you with specific details because I don't want this to be about me. I want this to be about you and why you should care about number theory and prime numbers. I'm aiming this talk at a very, very general audience because I want people to appreciate why prime numbers are interesting, even if your field is partial differential equations or mathematical logic or something else, I want people to get something out of this talk. So I'm gonna aim it at the students. So let's begin with a very basic definition. A whole number is prime if it cannot be factored as a product of two smaller whole numbers. So I told you I'm keeping this really basic here. Four is not prime because it factors as two times two. On the other hand, two, three, and five are prime because Try as you might, you cannot factor two, three, five, and seven as a product of smaller whole numbers. You just can't. Now there's a physical way we can think about this. I promised that I was gonna gesture, so I'm gonna point here. So six is not prime, it's a composite number. What does that mean? Well, physically it means if I have six objects, I can arrange them in a proper rectangular array, like we have here. I think I have some fancy pointer here that's digital. So that means I can take six objects, arrange them in a proper rectangular array, and by proper I mean not in a single line because that would be kind of silly. So we see the two factorizations of six here physically in the actual universe. Seven is a prime. Hopefully I said six is not a prime, let's say it's composite. Seven is a prime that manifests itself physically in the sense that if I take seven objects, I can try all I want. I will never be able to arrange those seven objects into a nice rectangular array unless I put them all in a line, and that would be kind of silly. Now, the primes are the building blocks of arithmetic. They're the building blocks of the whole numbers. Sorry for the feedback there. Um, so 12 is 2 times 2 times 3. Every whole number factors as a product of primes in an essentially unique way up to order. Even numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that factors as 3 times 5 times 823, a rather large and unwieldy looking prime. And here's a number that appeared in the news this morning. If those of you who checked your newspapers probably saw this number, 792,022, all over the news. That factors as 2 times 7 times 11 times 37 times 139. 
You might say, I don't recall seeing that. Well, you did, that's the, the day's date. Any natural number can be factored as a product of primes. And so the primes are the building blocks of the natural numbers. The natural numbers are the building blocks of the integers. From the integers, you get the rational numbers. From the rational numbers, you get the real numbers. From the real numbers, you get the complex numbers and so on and so forth. So it might be a slight exaggeration to say, but I think the prime numbers are fundamental building blocks of mathematics itself. And you might say, it's all Greek, because this goes back to the ancient Greeks. Euclid was thinking about primes. This is Euclid's theorem, his proof, or his proposition, as he called them, that there are infinitely many prime numbers. And this is how it would have appeared if it were printed in the original Greek, proposition 20 in book nine of Euclid's Elements. And so you might say, that looks not like number theory. But remember, Euclid did not have algebra. To Euclid, algebra wasn't invented for you know, over a 1,000 years after. So Euclid had to think about numbers as lengths of line segments. To Euclid, a perfect square was the area of an actual square. So that's why this looks like geometry more than number theory. But Euclid proved 2,300 years ago there are infinitely many prime numbers. The formal study of prime numbers dates back to the ancient Greeks. Euclid is the person that happened to write the most successful textbook on geometry, but also number theory. Euclid has books on number theory, the later parts of the element. So he lived in Alexandria about 2,300 years ago. And unfortunately for him, they didn't have copyright laws and royalties and that sort of stuff, and he didn't live for 2,000 years. But his textbook was used for 2,000 years to teach geometry, uh, both solid and planar, but also number theory. So, uh, he certainly would have beaten Stewart for the most successful textbook writer uh, if he sort of lived in the same time. But it's not actually all Greek, because if you go back a little bit further, about 3,500 years ago, there's the rind papyrus that was found. This is ancient Egyptian, and you can actually see here, um, you know, they're doing some familiar math. There's problems on triangles and so on and so forth, written in hieroglyphics. And there are some computations there that involve prime numbers. The Egyptians, unlike the ancient Greeks, like Euclid, didn't study number theory as its own thing. They didn't appreciate logic for its own sake. For them, mathematics was a practical endeavor. They were thinking about questions such as, I've got a field and I need to divide it among the four sons of the farmer. How do I do that? What, what, what area of land should I give them? So they thought about practical matters. They didn't study number theory for its own sake. They didn't do theorems and proofs. If you go back even further, about 20,000 years ago, there was a bone fag, uh, fragment, the Ishango bone that was found in what was then the Belgian Congo. Made 20,000 years ago, clearly made by humans, somebody had carved in to this bone sequences of scratches, 19, 17, 13, and 11. So somebody 20,000 years ago in Africa was thinking about mathematics, tallying things. Now, it's likely that they weren't doing number theory, and it's probably just coincidence that we had 19, 17, 13, and 11, those are prime numbers. Probably coincidence, because this bone contains some non-prime markings too. But the evidence still suggests that somebody 20,000 years ago was thinking about math. Maybe that was the first number theorist, maybe they were just counting the number of beans they had, who knows. But somebody was doing math 20,000 years ago. Math is, of course, a universal language. We have many different ways of talking about the same idea. The numbers one through 10 that we think about in terms of Arabic numerals there at the top, we also have been taught to think of in terms of Roman numerals, which is in the third line here. But many other civilizations and cultures have discovered, using their own language and notation, the idea of one, two, three, four, et cetera. These things seem to be universal, or at least that's my personal take on the matter. It's sort of a philo philosophical question to push that much further. But humans have many notations for talking about the same thing. And our biology also influences how we talk about things. Our preference for base 10 stems from the fact that most humans have 10 fingers. Some civilizations did things base 20 because they counted toes as well. But our preference for 10 in everything is really an accident of biology. If we were like this guy here who had 12 perfectly functioning fingers, we would have developed base 12 arithmetic. That means we would have had symbols all the way up to nine plus two extra ones, smiley face and frowny face or something else to handle the numbers 10 and 11. And a dollar would have 144 cents to it. And that would make total sense to us because our whole lives would have been built around base 12 arithmetic. So our preference for our notation and our style of arithmetic is sort of influenced by who we are and, and how we're shaped. Now let me tell you a little bit about 
sort of the small scale structure of primes. If I take a look at primes, they seem kind of random, and that's going to be a common theme in this talk. First thing we're going to note is that the primes contain arbitrarily large gaps. There are sometimes huge gaps, deserts, in the prime numbers where you don't have primes. And here's, this is the closest thing to a proof that you'll see in this talk. If I want to find, say, four consecutive composite numbers, that is, non-prime numbers, what I can do is take a look at five factorial. That gives me 120. 120 is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5. So it's automatically divisible by 2, 3, 4, and 5, right? And so what I can do is tack on an extra 2 and get to 122. That's a sum of two even numbers. Therefore, it's divisible by 2. 122 is divisible by 2, so it's not prime. It's composite. 123, let's see if I can get this thing to work. 123, that's a sum of two numbers that are divisible by 3. So it is divisible by 3, and hence not prime. 124, sum of two numbers divisible by 4, et cetera. So what I have now is a string of four composite numbers in a row. There's nothing stopping me from doing this for 100 billion. If I wanted to find 100 billion composite numbers in a row, that desert in the prime numbers exists there somewhere out there in the dot, dot, dot realm. You know, when we say one, two, three, dot, 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 it's somewhere way out there, light years away, but it still exists. Now, primes also sometimes come very close together. So we're going to say that primes that differ by two are twin primes. So 17 and 19 are twin primes. On the other hand, 47 is not a twin prime. It's sort of lonely. Why? Because if I take a look at candidates for twins, I'm looking at 45, which isn't prime, or 49, which isn't prime. So 47 is a prime, but it is not a twin prime. This is something for the students to think about. It is a famous unsolved problem to determine whether there are infinitely many twin primes. Remember, Euclid proved 2,300 years ago that there are infinitely many primes. We still don't know whether there are infinitely many twin primes. It would bring you fame and fortune if you figured out this problem. It's a difficult problem, but people have probably been thinking about it for over 2,000 years. Because I'm pretty sure, even though Euclid didn't write this conjecture down, he was probably thinking about it. Didn't come up with anything for it, but he's probably thinking about it. So this is a problem that's over 2,000 years old, and you know it's a pretty big deal if you are able to solve it. Now you might say, yeah, this is too abstract. I prefer concrete things. I prefer applications. What do I mean by applications? Well, you probably mean money, right? That's usually what we mean by applications, math that makes money. In this case, this is make, making negative money, so that's slightly different. But uh, TR Nicely, back in 1994, computed all the twin primes up to 10 to the 14 to do some experiments in analytic number theory related to what is called Brun's constant, which is neither here nor there. Now, the thing that Nicely noticed is that the computer he was using was making mistakes. It turned out that the Pentium chip, which was Intel's flagship product, had a problem. It, couldn't do math correctly. So it had a floating point division bug built into it. There was a problem in the way that it handled floating point division. And of course, for a computer not to be able to do math accurately is, is bad. And that costs Intel hundreds of millions of dollars, allegedly. So that's an application. It's a negative application, but it's money. OK. So sometimes primes do some weird things. We know that there are gaps between them that are really large. We know sometimes they seem to come close together. They also conspire to do very strange things. So Stanislav Ulam was sitting in a talk kind of like this, but with a speaker that was much less engaging, I hope, and was doodling. And you were supposed to laugh at that, but anyways. anyways. So he was doodling on graph paper and started with this rectilinear spiral, starting with one, two, three, et cetera, spiraled out on the graph paper. And what Ulam did was filled in the squares that, con that corresponded to prime numbers. And so Ulam noticed some patterns when he continued this rectilinear spiral going out. Right? Just, you can do this as much as you want. And he started noticing some interesting results. So let me see if you can spot what is going on here. So I, I've removed the labels at this point to make things a little bit clearer. So, You'll notice that the primes, which are supposed to be random, seem to be doing something on the large scale when you look at this Ulam spiral. You will probably note that there are suggestions of diagonal lines, if I can get this correct. It looks like a pretty strong diagonal line there, some diagonals, diagonal structure, right? That's not random, right? 
I think you agree there's some structure there. There are some suggestions of very clear diagonal lines in this picture. You might say, well, so what? Primes are built into the nature of the universe. Natural numbers are there in our universe. I, I, I personally think that they're built into the structure of the universe. So primes are doing something really weird. They're conspiring over vast distances to make these large-scale structures. Because think about it. You know, why, why is this diagonal line appearing? Well, it means that, okay, that blue dot is a prime. And then when I go around the spiral arm and come back to the next place, there's gonna be a prime there. And when I go around another full revolution around the spiral and come back, there's gonna be another prime there. So they're conspiring over very long distances. It's not like they're just nearest neighbors lining up to do this. They're primes that are really spread far apart and somehow they're collaborating with each other, they're communicating with each other to form these large scale patterns. That should strike you as very, very, very strange. The presence of this diagonal structure doesn't look random, it looks like something very unusual is going on, indeed something is. Now there's a good heuristic explanation for why this occurs that maybe I can go into at the end of the talk. Number theorists think they have an explanation for why this happens, but of course they, they have a compelling argument for why this should be, but not a, not a complete proof yet. So what do primes have to do with extraterrestrials? Something maybe a little bit more pressing here. Okay, mathematics I claim is a universal language. That means mathematics could be used to begin a dialogue with an alien civilization. And in fact, this has been thought of. Now the basis of this is the belief that math is universal. And here's my argument, I have no way of testing it. I claim that if you take 47 objects and put them on the table here, well, you'd be interrupting my talk and that would be annoying, but if you had 47 objects and you put them on the table, you'll never be able to arrange them into a proper rectangular array. That's just a property of 47, not the symbols 47 that we're using, not the fact that I'm speaking in English or writing things in the Roman alphabet. It has nothing to do with that. It's not a human property. It's the property of the quantity 47. I'll never be able to do that. Now, if I take those objects to Saturn and try the same experiment, I'm going to have the same problem, I think. I can't test this. If I take this to the other side of the galaxy, I think I'll probably still have the same problem. That alien civilization over there that has 47 balls or blobs or boxes, I think they're still gonna encounter the same problem because this idea of 47 being a prime number, not being able to be factored, I think is built into the universe. That's a philosophical position, but that's, that's what I think. Now, this idea of using primes to communicate with alien civilizations goes back at least to Carl Sagan. So in Carl Sagan's novel, Contact, which I think everyone should read, it's a great novel, surprisingly woke for the time period it was written in, which is like 1980s, early 90s, uh, very forward thinking. He looks at how scientists, politicians, and religious leaders would respond to a message from an extraterrestrial intelligence. Spoiler, not well. <laughs> now, Jodie Foster played the protagonist in the 1997 movie, which, if you don't have the patience for the book, watch the movie, it's actually quite good. I think the book is better. And so the idea here is that we receive a signal, you know, we, we're pointing radio telescopes out in the heavens looking for aliens. And then we receive strings of zeros and ones. And then that string repeats. And then it repeats again. So clearly somebody is sending us a string of zeros and ones. And when we, our scientists investigate this and try and put together what this message means, we get things like this. Now this is kind of summarized here in a still from the movie, but you can see what is getting across here. Even though the aliens don't speak English, don't know anything about us, right? They're communicating with scientists in America. Well, they're not really communicating, they're communicating with the whole world. That's one of the themes of the book is, is the, the fact that we are not special as Americans. They're aliens or don't single us out because we're better or smarter than anyone else. And that's part of the source of tension in the book. But you can see here, you could quickly get across the idea of what the symbol for false and what the symbol for true are. So truth and falsehood are pretty deep philosophical ideas. And you can communicate what the symbols these aliens are using for true and false would be, relatively simply. So you can communicate elementary arithmetic even though you don't speak the same language, even though the aliens probably have 22 appendages and tentacles and things like that. They're totally different, but the math is probably gonna be the same. And we can begin to communicate mathematics. And so once you can communicate mathematics, we can start thinking about communicating science. Because let's face it, as, we, as mathematicians, we kind of all believe we're the foundations of the sciences. But think about it this way. If I want to talk about chemistry, I can do that with math. Why? Because the elements are already numbered. 
If I want to talk about hydrogen, that has one proton. Helium has two protons, right? I mean, the, the elements are numbered. So I can begin talking about chemistry and other, other, other sciences. So I can begin, not a dialogue because of the distance, but I can at least begin to understand what the message the alien sent is. You might be surprised to know that this is based off a true story. It's the other way around. We're the aliens. That's the problem. So in 1974, we sent a message out to the globular cluster M13, a string of zeros and ones, 1,679 zeros and ones to be precise. Why did we do this? Well, it's kind of a good publicity stunt for searching for extraterrestrial intelligence. I don't think anything is going to come of it. But, you know, we did this. M13 is a globular cluster, about 300,000 stars, about 145 light years in diameter. The reason we chose this is, well, Stars in globular clusters are typically a lot older than typical stars, so they've been there for billions of years. That means there's a decent chance that they've developed solar systems, and there's enough time for uh, alien life to evolve there, perhaps rise to the level of civilization. Hopefully they don't destroy themselves like we probably will, but let's assume they don't destroy themselves. There might be somebody there to receive our message. It'll take 22,000 years for the message to get there, so that means we're pretty safe. So in the worst possible case, you know, we'll get invaded by aliens because we told them we're here in, in 22,000 years or 42,000 years or whatever. Uh, we won't have to deal with that. So here's the message that was sent. 1,679 factors as 73 times 23. Why do we pick that? Well, because if I have, if I keep sending this block of 1,769 bits, that's going to suggest to the alien that I look at that block as the message. And I say, well, hey, Strange, that factors is 73 times 23. What does that mean? So it doesn't take a great leap of imagination to say, well, why don't I plot these bits in a grid that's 73 by 23? And when you do that, you get this picture. Now, color has been added for emphasis because this would have been a black and white image. It's pretty pixelated, but that, well, that's what you could do in 1974. We could do something much better now. We could send them HDTV or whatever. But the point is, we have information about our number system. That's the stuff there in the white chemical makeup of DNA and some of our biology, because again, the elements are numbered, and they're pre-labeled for us, so that's great. And, you know, all the information that you could probably want to launch an attack and destroy us. But again, we don't have to worry about that. Why do we think aliens will figure this out if we send this message? Well, hopefully, at least, if they're at least advanced as we are, they'll figure it out, right? Well, all you have to do is have 20th century technology. And the other thing is, nothing in nature seems to produce prime numbers. 73 and 23, those are numbers that just don't pop up in nature. There's, that seems to suggest, you know, that something is odd there. Right? Prime numbers don't seem to appear in nature, except in evolution. And so that's the next thing I'm going to tell you about, how prime numbers seem to appear in evolution in strange ways. So you might recall from a year or so ago that there are these periodic cicadas that come out in certain parts of the eastern United States, and they come out all at once every few years, every few being 13 or 17 years. So there are cicadas. I call them locusts because that sounds better. If I say hordes of locusts, that sounds a bit more epic and biblical, right? So it sounds more, cicadas just don't have the same ring. But in any case, they have 13 or 17 year life cycles, these diff different species in this genus. So what happens, they lurk around underground as larvae doing whatever larvae do for 13 years, and then they pop up and then fly around, mate, and die. It's not an exciting life. But they have these very long life cycles. Why are the primes 13 and 17 involved? Sort of strange numbers to arise. But I can tell you evolutionarily why this might have occurred. I'm not a biologist. I'm not claiming this is true or fact. I may be lying to you. But I'll give you a plausibility argument. So if I have two animal species, and their life cycles are four years and six years long, well, they're going to interact and hatch out every 12 years at the same time, right? They're going to, you know, a lot of times they're going to be not, you know, they'll have the world to themselves, right? But every 12th year, they're going to hatch out at the same time and compete with each other over resources. They're, they might come into conflict, right? Now, if I change those life cycles a little bit and instead use three and seven year life cycles, then most of the time they're great and they have the world to themselves, except every 21 years they may come into conflict over resources or something else, right? Now, that's just a subtle change from four to three and six to seven, right? 
but you can see that that might be an advantage to do that sort of thing. So if you look at 13 and 17 year life cycles, then they only hatch out in the same year every 221 years, which is a great thing from an evolutionary perspective. And this is one possible explanation for why this occurs, why prime numbers like 13 and 17 have appeared in this particular context. Now, let me go back to the structure of the primes. And this is a quote from Don Zagier, a great number theorist. And this gives you sort of the perspective of why primes are strange. So Zagier says, there are two facts about the distribution of prime numbers of which I hope to convince you so overwhelmingly that they will be permanently engraved in your hearts. So like tattooed on your body, in your heart. So the first thing is, despite their simple definition and role as the building blocks of the natural numbers, the prime numbers grow like weeds among the natural numbers, seeming to obey no other law than that of chance. In other words, random, right? Read random there. And nobody can predict where the next one will sprout. So the primes are random. Now, the second point is even more astonishing, for it states just the opposite, that the prime numbers exhibit stunning regularity and that there are laws governing their behavior and that they obey these laws with almost military precision. So, He's saying that there's two things. The primes seem random, at least when you look at things on a small scale, but when you step back and look at the bigger picture, there are actually some fundamental laws that the primes seem to obey on the grandest scales. And let me tell you uh, about one of these laws. The prime number theorem is what we're leading up to. Let pi of x, pi for p, right? Not, has nothing to do with circles and stuff. Pi of x denote the number of primes at most x. So you count the primes that are less than or equal to x. You keep a running tally of them. So for example, pi of 10.5 is four, because you look at how many primes there are less than or equal to 10.5, was well, two, three, five, and seven, right? So there's only four of them, so pi of 10.5 is four. The prime number theorem, one of the greatest theorems in mathematics, one of the most uh, stupendous achievements of human intellect is this theorem, and I wanna tell you why this is a great theorem. Pi of x, the prime counting function, is talking about discrete stuff. It's talking about the prime numbers, the nature of the universe, right? The natural numbers, the primes, it's, but it's discrete stuff. Now, what this is saying is the rate of growth of pi of x, right? So pi of x has the same rate of growth as x over natural log of x, right? That's what this limit expression is saying. Asymptotically, pi of x is kind of like x over log x in the biggest scale. And so that is connecting the discrete pi of x, primes, natural numbers, to the continuous calculus, logarithms, limits, right? So there's a connection between the world of number theory and calculus, and it's a profound result. Now, it was conjectured by Gauss when he was a teenager, because like all teenagers, they ponder tables of primes and things like that and do calculations at home. So Gauss, you know, this is an incredible thing. Gauss is looking at tables of primes that were published and says like, hey, that kind of looks like x over log x. That's pretty amazing, no computers there. He had to do computations you know, on paper in his head, right? If I ask students here, hey, tell me what log of 47 is to five decimal places, no calculators, you'd be stuck here the rest of the lecture, right? I'm not asking the professors because they would get upset at me because they can't do it either probably. So you know, that's an amazing testament to Gauss's skill. And he actually conjectured a more accurate version of the prime number theorem. It took about 100 years for this theorem to be proved. It was proved by Hadamard and de la vallee in 1896 using complex analysis. So that means super fancy calculus with imaginary numbers, contour integrals in the complex plane, lots of fancy stuff that doesn't seem to have anything to do with prime numbers and arithmetic. It was hoped for many years that maybe there's a simpler proof. Maybe there's a proof that doesn't require this digression into the complex plane, something that will lay bare the foundations of arithmetic and number theory. Maybe there's a proof for it that avoids complex analysis. And so in 1949, Erdős and Zellberg discovered so-called elementary proofs of the prime number theorem. By elementary, it's in quotes, that doesn't mean easy. They're really difficult. They're collections of Erdős type tricks that somehow at the end lead to the prime number theorem, but they don't use complex analysis at all. There was a bitter priority dispute between Erdős and Zellberg about who should get the credit for this. You can read about that on the internet if you want. There's a nice historical paper on the topic. Uh, Erdős might have been upset that Zellberg got a Fields Medal and he didn't, so you know, I'm not gonna dwell on that, but you know, there's some controversy over this result. And let's take a look at pi of x. 
So pi of x jumps every time you hit a prime number, right? So I jump up by one at two, I jump up at three, but four isn't prime, so I stay put. I jump up at five, I jump up at seven. And so pi of x looks like this. The prime counting function just bumps up by one every time you hit a prime. Sometimes you have some flat parts. This is because between seven and 11, there's no jump, right? This is, there's no jump between seven, uh, between 13 and 19. I'm sorry, wait, no, what am I doing? Uh, between 13 and 17 here, right? And you jump up in swift succession when you hit twin prime. So this is an irregular jumpy function. That's my point, right? It's an irregular jumpy function. The prime number theorem says, if I step back and look at the largest scales, something is going on here. Let's compare this with x over log x. I'm cheating here. I'm doing something slightly more accurate. That's x over the quantity log x minus 1. So that's the function I'm graphing here. And let's do some comparisons. You can see on the largest scale, the agreement becomes really quite good. So what is happening here is that you can see the prime number theorem right in front of your eyes. The prime numbers, kind of random on the small scale, on the largest scale, seem to have some structure. And we can pull from the prime number theorem a useful heuristic. It says the following. So prime number theorem says that pi of x, the prime counting function, kind of behaves asymptotically like x over log x. Right? That's what the prime number theorem says. Now some hand waving, which I'm actually doing here, says that, well, if you do some integration by parts and some calculus, you can show that x over log x has the same rate of growth as this integral here, where x is the variable. And hand wave some more. Right? We say, well, Riemann sums, et cetera, et cetera, this integral kind of should behave like this, where I approximate with Riemann sums. So, oh, sorry about that. And so what we're really saying is that pi of x kind of behaves like this sum here. But that begins to look like an expectation, like an expected value. So it's almost like we're saying that the probability that n is prime is 1 over log n. And so how many primes do we expect to get by the time we reach x? Well, we compute the expected value here. We sum up the probabilities. And so we should get this. So we can begin to interpret the prime number theorem as saying something probabilistic. This is all hand waving, and it's, it's not actually true. Why? Because the primes aren't random. They're built into the universe, right? But we're treating them as if they're something random. But this is a useful heuristic. It leads us sometimes to the correct predictions. So this heuristic and common sense, I put in quotes, what do I mean by common sense? Well, there's some obvious things about the primes. Two is the only even prime, right? So what's the probability that an even number is prime? Well, it's really small, isn't it? So there's some common sense things. And you'd have to look at what happens with three and five and seven and stuff. But when you build that into your model, and you do some work, you're led to what's called the Bateman-Horn conjecture, uh, one of the big open problems in number theory. So big, I doubt any of us will live to see it proved. I will, I'm not going to state the conjecture here. I might get back to it at the end of the talk if people have questions. But it's, an, it's a conjecture that basically says this is how the primes behave in the largest scales. And it allows us to make some predictions that always seem to turn out to be startlingly accurate, at least to the extent of the computers that we can use. I bring this up here because this is one of the first documented instances of undergraduate research. Bateman was a number theory professor at the University of Illinois. Roger Horn, pictured here, was an undergraduate at Cornell. And there was, I, think, I believe, an NSF-funded sort of, it wasn't an RU, because they didn't call them RUs back then, but there was a summer research program that Roger attended that was run by Bateman. And it used the fancy thing called a computer. And it turns out that this iliac computer, when you play around with punch cards and magnetic tape and whatever they did, allowed them to make some interesting conjectures. And this led to the so-called Bateman-Horn conjecture, which will appear later on, that basically refines this probabilistic prediction and actually makes some great predictions about a wide range of topics related to primes. Now, I bring this up for a product placement reason. I actually wrote a book with Roger Horn a few years ago on linear algebra because like most RUs, you do something on some specific topic, but maybe you go to grad school and work on something completely different, right? So it turns out Roger only has two papers in number theory, both dating from the early 1960s from his RU. And so he is now known as a matrix theorist. He's one of the foremost authorities in the world on linear algebra. And most of his colleagues, including me, didn't know that he is connected to this big conjecture in number theory that he made you know, in, with Bateman when he was an undergraduate. So it was only after I had written the book with him that I realized, wait, you're the horn from Bateman Horn, aren't you? And he said, yeah. So it's an interesting fact. Now, 
Let's go back to movies again. So this is a still from The Man Who Knew Infinity, 2015. It is a movie about the life of Srinivasa Ramanujan, one of the great mathematical stories. I, don't, I could give several lectures on how interesting Ramanujan is and his relationship with G.H. Hardy. So students who are not familiar of the with the story of Hardy and Ramanujan, make sure you look this up or at least watch the movie if that's how you want to take in information. It's one of the most compelling and interesting and beautiful stories in mathematics. G.H. Hardy was uh, a very good analyst and number theorist in the early 20th century, and he had a lot of interesting things to say. One of the things he says is the theory of numbers has always been regarded as one of the most obviously useless branches of pure mathematics. A science is said to be useful if its development tends to accentuate the existing inequalities in the distribution of wealth or more directly promotes the destruction of human life. So that's his definition of what useful means. The theory of prime numbers satisfies no such criteria. So he then takes pride in this. He says, I've never done anything useful in the sense that nothing evil, right? no discovery of mine has made or is likely to make directly or indirectly for good or ill the least difference to the amenity of the world. So this is one of the things he says, I'm doing number theory because I think it's beautiful and I'm not gonna hurt anyone with it. Right? That's why I like pure mathematics. He was sort of the purest of the pure. Now, strange thing that I'm sure he didn't consider, he's the Hardy from Hardy Weinberg in genetics. One of the things that you learn at the beginning of any intro genetics class. This is something a lot of mathematicians don't know because we're, we're used to thinking of G.H. Hardy as the purest of the pure, the person who hated applied math, hated applications. Turns out he's the Hardy from the Hardy Weinberg. That is also an interesting story that would take a lecture to talk about. But you can think about it this way. If he was so against applications of mathematics to, um, to distribute wealth in unequal ways and to hurt people, I think he would probably be very sad to see where genetics, for the students, in the mid-1900s, some bad stuff happened when he mixed science and pseudoscience and genetics. You know, I think he would have been heartbroken to see that the Hardy-Weinberg law, the thing that he's most well known for in the general population, was used for, you know, to justify some really horrible things. Let's go to something more cheery. Secrecy and spying and government spying on us and all this sort of stuff. Encryption. Modern encryption methods are public knowledge. That may surprise you, it's public knowledge. No, why is that? Because your phone in your pocket has the encryption software that you use to talk to the bank, right? Your laptop has the software that does the encryption when you buy something off Amazon. So the software is here, right? So it's no secret. But the modern encryption methods are really, 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 really good, right? On the other hand, phishing is easy, which is why when you check your spam filter today, you found so many lost relatives that have wills leaving you millions of dollars, right? It's much easier to fish and get people's passwords than to try to break them by brute force. So let me tell you a little bit about how number three comes into this. Let's use this as a toy model, the Caesar cipher. So this is the encryption method, the Caesar cipher. It goes back to Julius Caesar. The method is you shift the alphabet by a certain amount. That's the method, that's the software. Now, to use this, you need a key. That key is the shift amount. Obviously, you could break this uh, by brute force because there's only 26 possibilities, but to use this sort of thing, you need a key, right? That's typically the case. You have the software installed on both ends of the computer and you have to agree on a key before using that software. Right? And so here's a problem. For Alice and Bob, two parties to communicate securely, they need to agree on a key. The problem is how do they share the key because they can't communicate securely, right? You don't want to shout your key across the room and say, hey, my key is 47, because everyone will hear it and they'll be able to decrypt the messages, right? So that seems to be a fundamental problem. They need to be able to talk securely to be able to talk securely. And this was sort of a paradox, if you will, that had lingered around for thousands of years until people figured out a clever way around this. So it relies on trapdoor functions, one-way mathematical uh, operations. So let me give you an example of a one-way mathematical operation. If I take two 1,000-digit prime numbers and I multiply them together, that happens instantly on a computer, and I get a number that's around 2,000 digits long. That's easy to do. Now, if I take that 2,000 digit number and tell the computer I want you to find its prime factorization, that could take longer than the age of the universe. It may surprise you. Multiplying, easy. 
factoring incredibly hard. Now, how would you go about dealing with this 2,000-digit number? The naive way would be check to see if it's divisible by 2, see if it's divisible by 3, by 5, by 7, by 11, by 13, and you can sort of see you're going to run out of time before the universe ends, if that's going to be the case. So one way, easy to do in one direction, very hard to do in the other direction. I'm not saying that encryption uses this. It's a little, this is a little bit too simple. But this is what I mean by a one-way operation, a trapdoor function. And this is a pictorial idea about how encryption works and how you can exchange keys in public. So Alice and Bob want to communicate. So they have common paints that are depicted here in yellow. They take the can of paint and they go into their garage in secret, on, in their own house. They're separated by miles. They go into their garage and they dump in some secret paint that only they know, because they're doing it in the privacy of their own home, no observers. And then they get these colors here, sort of a peach color and a blue color. Now, they need to exchange some information somehow. They need to get a common key. So what they're going to do, they're going to be bold, and they're going to take this new mixed paint, they're going to put them in clear containers, and Bob is going to have a truck driver drive this clear container of his bluish paint all the way to Alice's house. Alice is going to have a truck driver drive this clear container of peach color paint all the way to Bob's house. This is going to be done completely in public. The whole public will be able to say, hey, that's Bob's paint there. Oh, wait, there, there's Alice's paint. I can see it's peach. It's peach, right? That's going to happen in the public. Now, what's going to happen? Alice and Bob will have swapped paint. They go back into their garages. And now they add their original secret color that no one can see. What's going to happen at the end is they've got this muddy brown stuff. No real information has been communicated, but they have agreed upon a key. The key is that brown color, right? They have agreed upon a key, despite the fact that the transmission happened in public with everyone seeing it. So they now have agreed on some parameter in secret. And there's no way that anyone can figure this out, because even if somebody hijacks the trucks here and somebody stops this truck, right, what are they going to do with the peach paint? You can't unmix paint. That's the one-way idea. It's easy to mix, but you can't unmix. You can't figure out what Alice was doing in her garage. You can't figure out that she was dealing with orange. So this is how one-way um, operations can be used to develop secure key exchange algorithms. So the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol is based on this next property of primes. I'm not going to explain how the protocol works. Uh, I just want you to trust me that there's some really cool number theory that goes into this that you would learn in a typical uh, upper division number theory course. There's this cool property of primes. I want to get back to primes. So prime numbers, like five, have what are called generators. The fancy term is primitive roots. And what I mean by that is this prime 5 might have some other number that works well with it. And this is going to be 2 in this example. What I'm going to do is look at the number 2 and take its powers. So I get 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, etc. Then I'm going to divide by 5 and take the remainder. Students who have taken algebra and are familiar, we're doing modular arithmetic, arithmetic mod 5. The point is, I take a look at those remainders upon division by 5. So for example, 16 leaves a remainder of 1 when I divide by 5. 32 leaves a remainder of 2 when I divide by 5. I take a look at that pattern of remainders. I look at the power of 2, divide by 5, look at the remainders, and I get 2, 4, 3, 1. And that pattern repeats. 2, 4, 3, 1, 2, 4, 3, 1. That happens to be a permutation of the numbers less than 5. That's a permutation of 1, 2, 3, 4. And that turns out to be a cool and valuable property that comes up all the time in number theory and its applications. We're going to say that 2 is a generator for the prime 5. The fancy term is primitive root. I might use that. So 2 is a generator for the prime 5 because it generates 1, 2, 3, 4 when you exponentiate in this fashion. Now, not every number is a generator for a given prime. Let's change the prime, but let's keep the 2. If I take a look at the prime 7, and I look at the powers of 2, but now instead of dividing by 5, I divide by 7, I'll get a different pattern of remainders. So for example, 8 divided by 7 leaves a remainder of 1. 16 divided by 7 leaves a remainder of 2, and so forth. So what that means is I have a different pattern of remainders. It's now 2, 4, 1, 2, 4, 1, 2, 4, 1. And so that means that 3, 5, and 6 are missing from this list of remainders. And I consider that not a good thing. Right? So 2 is not a generator for the prime 7, because I did not generate 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 in some order. I only got 2, 4, and 1. 
So two is not a generator for seven. And so this is a table of data that I presented to my number theory class about five years ago. And my point was this. Primes are random. Primes are weird. We can't predict things. There's no patterns here. That's, that was my point. You know, so you can see here, the list of generators for various primes, right? So when does 10 appear on this list? Kind of a weird thing. That's related to an old problem of Gauss. When does 2 appear on this list? Yeah, that's a kind of interesting question, right? So my point was, look at this information. It's kind of random. It's kind of weird. It's not predictable. And, well, thanks to Elvis Cohoro, who was one of the students in the class, he looked at this for five seconds and raised his hand and asked a question that many people wouldn't ask, because they're afraid to ask questions. He's not afraid. And he said, wait, I, I think I see a pattern here. After five seconds, and I'll try and put you in his brain as best I can. I'll color code things. And this is how he was thinking. I'm looking at twin primes. Twin primes are going to come in colored pairs, red and blue, red and blue, red and blue. So. What he says here is, hey, it kind of looks like if I have a twin pair prime like 59 and 61, the first one seems to have more generators, seems to have more primitive roots than the second one, or at least as many, right? So same thing with 41 and 43. The first of the twin primes seems to have at least as many on its list as the second one. And that seems to be the case, right? 17 and 19, same thing. 11 and 13, same thing. That was a pattern you noticed, without the color coding, of course. I think that's an amazing uh, question for a student to ask. And so he looked into this. It's an interesting conjecture, Kahoro's conjecture. Is it true that for twin primes, except three and five, because it's a little bit tricky, because you've got three, five, and seven, right? You've got two pairs there overlapping, right? So is it true for twin primes, except three, let's ignore the first ones, that when I have a twin prime pair, the first prime has at least as many generators as the second. The red list is at least as long as the blue list. So let G of P denote the number of generators that prime P has. Number theorists will recognize that this can be phrased in terms of the Euler totient function, but I don't want to burden things with notation. So G of P is the number of generators, the length of the list corresponding to the prime P. So his conjecture is this. That if I got twin primes, p and p plus 2, g of p is greater than or equal to g of p plus 2, right? The red list is always bigger than the blue list that comes after it, right? That's the conjecture. So let's check it out. This is the initial data. So what does this mean? Well, I've got twin primes here. So there's a red dot, and it's always followed by a blue dot to the right. The red dot should always be you know, at the same level as the blue dot or higher, right? That's what the conjecture is saying. Red dot should always at least be at the level of the blue dot that immediately follows it. Oh, well, I had a close call here, right? But the you know, red dot is always higher than the blue dot that follows it. This is great. So we have a theorem, right? Something is going on here. There's a theorem here. This is looking pretty good, isn't it? So we got a theorem, right? No, the universe isn't so nice. That is a counterexample right there. This pair, I got a blue dot above a red dot that's right next to it. And if I step back a little bit further, oh, there's another one right here. So the conjecture is false. And this happens sometimes. You make a conjecture and it's just not true. But it's mostly true. And that's something. There's still something going on here, right? If I take a look at things over larger and larger scales, something is going on. The theorem is mostly true, right? As, I don't know, theorem has to be true or false, but it's like mostly true. And this is what's happening here. There's some definite structure going on here, and it's a strange thing for a theorem to be mostly true, and we have to figure out how to grapple with that. How do you phrase that? Well, the conjecture is false, as stated. 2381 and 2383 are primes, but 2381 has fewer generators than 2383. It's a counterexample. Conjecture is false, as stated. Now, there's only two counterexample pairs less than 10,000. This is what I mean by mostly true. In fact, when you just run the computation for days and days and days, you find that Elvis's hunch appears to be correct 98% of the time. So the theorem is 98% true. Okay, well, what do we do with that? Here's a weird thing. 
my office number happens to be 2383, which is one of the counterexamples there. <laughs> this was not known to me or not pointed out to me until I gave a talk. And uh, Omaira, who is one of the speakers later today, is the one that pointed it out to me in a talk. She said, wait, isn't 2383 your office number? And I said, oh, wow, you're right, it is. So I guess I can compartmentalize stuff. So a remarkable coincidence. In any case, there's a theoretical explanation for that strong bias you see where all the reds are above the blues. And it relies on the Bateman-Horn conjecture, which I alluded to earlier. Here's why. We don't know whether there are infinitely many twin primes. Remember, I told the young people to try and prove the twin prime conjecture. We think there are infinitely many twin primes. We don't know. So how can you talk about the large-scale behavior about twin primes unless you know there are infinitely many of them. So we have to, and this is customary in analytic number theory, to assume some sort of basic conjecture so that your problem makes sense. So the Bateman-Horn conjecture implies the twin prime conjecture. And if you allow that, then you can start talking about how do we, do we think that this conjecture is true? Do we think that the uh, red dots are always above the blue dots, or is it vice versa? But there's, there's a theoretical explanation for this bias. And we didn't prove that the 98% and 2% hold, but we did show that there is a bias, right? We have that there are at least 0.459% of the twin prime pairs out there are counterexamples. So it's not that there are finitely many counterexamples, there are infinitely many counterexamples, and in fact, a positive proportion of the twin primes form counterexamples to the conjecture. So this is what I mean by it's mostly true, and you know, we can prove, at least under the Bateman-Horn conjecture, that the theorem is true an overwhelming number of the time. We got at least 65% of the time things work out. We don't have the 98% and 2%, but we've at least shown that these counterexamples are stubborn, and there are at least you know, a fraction of a percent of the twin primes that are counterexamples. Now, the point of this is that uh, this shows the remarkable nature of mathematical collaboration these days. Flor Florian Luca is a noted number theorist, and we've written many papers over the years. He was one of the co-authors on this paper. We've written eight papers over the last 10 years or so together. I have never met him in person, and I think it's likely I was never even ever on the same continent with him. So it's remarkable that we can communicate and do mathematics at such great distances these days. And in fact, he was in South Africa at the time that he was in University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. That is the antipodal point to Claremont, California, where I work. You might say, Wait, but I thought you're from Pomona College. Isn't there a Pomona, California? Didn't we hear about the Pomona Fairplex and drag racing and stuff in one of the previous lectures? Yes, there is a Pomona, California, and Claremont is right next to Pomona, California, and Pomona College is in Claremont. So it's a long story. That would be another lecture to give the history of this. But that's the antipodal point for Claremont. So Florian could not have possibly been farther from me in the world unless he were at Mauritius or something, which is this island right here. Right? So it's sort of a strange thing. It's kind of a cool story how we can collaborate a student and me and a collaborator on the far side of the world. Now I'd like to end with ex extensions of these ideas beyond twin primes. So twin primes are spaced two apart. But we could talk about primes that are spaced four apart. Those are cousin primes, P and P plus four. Primes that are spaced six apart, P and P plus six, those are called sexy primes. I think it's a terrible name, but that is the name. <laughs> Right? And we can look at what happens to these sorts of problems, like numbers of generators, for prime pairs with different spacings. And you get data that looks like this. So you can sort of see that, okay, for twin primes, where the spacing is two, it looks like the inequality flips around around 2% of the time. And you'll notice if the spacing is 2, 8, 14, 20, 26, et cetera, you know, you have a relatively small proportion of numbers, uh, of prime pairs for which the inequality is flipped. That behavior is reversed if the spacing is 4 or 10 or 16 or 22, right? That, that behavior with a number of generators is flipped. And if you're dealing with spacings that are 6, 12, 18, and so forth, anything can happen. It's a pretty interesting thing. And this subject was studied by my student, uh, Tim Schaff and I, and also Florian Luca. I wanted not to give you technical details of the results, but you know, I wanted to point out that this, I think, is a really good uh, and heartwarming story. Tim was in the original gig economy. He was literally a drummer gigging in Los Angeles. That's how, what he did in his early 20s. At some point, he said, I should probably go to college. And he's a hardworking guy. He went to Pasadena City College. 
and eventually transferred to Pomona. He became my senior thesis student, and we did a lot of research together, uh, and he's a co-author on a paper that extends some of the observations that uh, Florian Luca and Elvis and I made, and he eventually became Pomona's valedictorian for 2017, which is an incredible accomplishment for a non-traditional student to come from a community college and go to a, one of the premier liberal arts colleges in the country and become its valedictorian. So I just wanted to share that with you, and I will leave with a bibliography that highlights the relevant papers if anyone is interested in looking up the details. Students are in blue, hopefully you can see that here. Anyone written in blue is an undergraduate student. I probably should have done that for Roger Horn because he was an undergraduate at the time, even though he's around 80 right now. Uh, but I'll leave it at that and I welcome any questions.